full cycles on the historical foundation of the indigenous critic. We appear to have come a long way from where this book began, with the Wendat statement Kandiarong and the critic of European civilization that developed among indigenous people in North America during the 17th century. Now it's time to bring the story full cycle. Recall how, by the 18th century, the indigenous critic and the deep questions it posed about money, faith, heredity, power, women's rights, women's rights, and personal and personal freedoms, were having an enormous influence on leading figures of, of the French Enlightenment, but also resulted in a, in a backlash among European thinkers, which produced an evolutionary framework for human history that remains broadly intact today. Protein history as a story of material process progress. That framework requests indigenous critics as innocent children of nature whose views of freedom were, were a mere side effect of their uncultivated way of life and could not possibly over over a serious challenge to contemporary social thought, which came increasingly to mean just European thought. In reality, we have not strayed for we have not strayed at all from the starting point because the conventional wisdom we've been challenging through this book, throughout this book about hunter gatherer societies the consen the consequences of farming the rise of creed of cities and states as its genesis right here right there with two god smith in the reaction against the indigenous critique of course the idea that human societies evolved over time was not particularly special to the 18th century or to, or to Europe. What was new in, uh, in the fiction of world history put forward by European writers of that century was an in insistence of classifying societies by means of subsistence, so that agriculture could be seen as a, fun as a fundamental way in the history of human affairs. An assumption that associates grew larger, they inevitably grew more complex, and that complexity means not just a greater differentiation of functions, but but also the reorganizations of human societies into hierarchical ranks governed from the top down. This European backlash was so effective that generations of philosophers, historians, Society, social science, social scientists, and almost one, uh, and almost one, and, and almost anyone else since who wishes to address the human story on a broad scale feels secure in the knowledge of how it should properly start and where it is leading. It begins with an imaginary collection of teeny hunter gatherer bands and ends with the current collection of capitalist nation states. Or some projection of what might come after them. Anything going on in between can be considered in, in can be considered interesting, mainly in so far as it contributed to moving us all on down that particular pathway. As we have seen discovering, our consequence is that huge swaths of the human past disappear from the purview of history or remain effectively invisible if, except to the eyes of a tiny number of researchers who rarely explain the implications of the, in the, of the findings which are let, any, let alone to anyone else. Since the 1980s, it has been commonplace for social theories to, cl to claim we are living in, in, in a new postmodern age marked with, by a suspicious suspicion towards meta-narratives. Meta this claim is often used as justification for a sort of hyper-specialization to catch one's intellectual net wider, to compare notes with colleges in other fields, even smacks of imposing a single imperialistic vision of history. For this very reason, the idea of progress is usually held up as a prime example of the way we, 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 
out of the way, we no longer think about history and society. But such claims are odd, since almost everyone making them nonetheless continues to think in evolutionary terms. We could go further, thinkers. We do we do seek to knit together to find to the findings of specialists to describe the course of human history on a grand scale haven't entirely got past the biblical notion of the Garden of Eden, the fall and subsequent inevitab inevitably of domination, blinded by the just so story of how human societies evolve, they can even see half of what's new now before their eyes. Their eyes. As a result, the same portrayers of world history who profess themselves believers in freedom, democracy, and women's rights, and women's rights continue to treat historical epochs of relative freedom, democracy, and women's rights as so many dark ages. Similarly, as we've seen, the concept of civilization is still largely reserved for societies whose defining characteristics include his high hands auto his high hand high handed counterparts, imperial conquest, and the use of slave labor presented with undeniable cases of large and materially sophisticated societies for which evidence of such things is, conspic is conspicuously lacking. Ancient centers like Teotihuacan or Knossos, for example, the standard recourse is to throw up one's hands and say, who can tell what's, what was really going on there, or insist the Ozymandians throne throne room must be lurking in there somewhere, but that we simply haven't won it yet. In which we consider James C. Scott's arguments about the last 5,000 5, years and ask, and, and ask whether current global arrangements were in fact inevitable. You may object, perhaps much of human history was more complicated than we usually admit, but surely what matters is how, is how things ended up. For at least 2,000 years, most of the world's population have been living under kings of, or emperors of one sort or another, even in places where monarchy did not exist. Much of Africa or Oceania, for example, we find that, at the very least, Patriarchy and often violent domination of, of other sorts having, have been widespread. Once established, such institutions are very hard to get rid of. Your, so, your objection might run. All you're saying is that the inevitable took a little longer to happen. That doesn't make it any less inevitable. Similarly, with farming, true, your objection might run. Agriculture might not have be, might not have transformed everything overnight, but surely it laid the groundwork of later systems of domination. What wasn't it really just a matter of time? Did not the very possibility of poly, filling up large surpluses of grain, in effect, lay a trap? Wasn't it inevitable that sooner or later some royal prince like Narmer or Egypt of Egypt would begin amassing? An amazing stock price for his henchmen, and over and once he did, and once he did, surely the game was over. Rival kingdoms and empires would quickly come into being. Some would find the means of to expand. They would insist on their subjects producing more and more grain, and the subjects would grow in number, even as the number of remaining free peoples tended to remain stable. Once again, was it not just a matter of time before one of the king of those kingdoms of those kingdoms, or as it turned out, turned out a small collection of them came up with a successful formula for world conquest, just the great combination of guns, camps, and steel, and imposed its system on everybody else. James Scott, a renowned political scientist.
who has devoted much of his career to understanding the Gulf states and those who succeed in everything in everything in everything them in human history as a compelling description of how this agricultural prep works. The Neolithic, he suggests, began with flood retreat agriculture, which was easy work and encouraged redistribution. The largest populations were, indeed, concentrated in little take environments, but the first states in the Middle East, he concentrates largely on this and China, developed a river. It areas with an especially strong focus on cereal agriculture, where barley, millet, and relatively limited access to a range of other steppes. The key of the the key to the importance of grain, Scott notes, is that it was durable, portable, easily easily divisible and quantifiable quantifiable by bulk, and therefore an ideal medium to serve as a basis for taxation. Going above ground, unlike say certain tubers of legumes, grain crops were also highly visible and amenable to appropriation. Cereal agriculture did not cause the rise of extractive states, but it was certainly predisposed to their physical requirements, like money. Grain allows a certain form of terrifying equivalence. Whatever the reasons why it initially became a predominant crop in a given region. As we've seen in Egypt, for example, this had much to do with changes in rituals for the dead. Once it happened, once this happened, a permanent kingdom could always emerge. However, Scott always Scott also points out that for much of his story this process turned out to be a threat for Disney found grain states as well, limiting them to areas that forward intensive agriculture and living surrounding highlands, fenlands and marshes largely beyond the reach. What's more, even within those confines, the green based kingdoms were fragile, always prone to collapse under the weight of overpopulation, ecological devastation, and the kind of endemic disease that, uh, that always seems to result when too many humans, domesticated animals, and parasites accumulated in one place. Ultimately, though, Scott's focus isn't really on state at all. It's about the barbarians, a term Scott, a term Scott uses for all those groups which came to surround the little islands of authoritarian bureaucratic rulers, rule, and which existed in a largely symbiotic relation in which them, with them, some ever shift, some ever shifting mix of reading, training, and mutual avoidance. As Scott argued about the field peoples of Southeast Asia, so some of these barbarians became effectively anarchists, organizing their lives in explicit op opposition to the fairly societies below, or to prevent the emergence of certified classes in their own mind myths. As we've seen, such conscious rejection of your creative values. Another example of cultural schism organizations could also give rise to hairy societies, a hurly burly of petty lords whose preeminence was founded on dramatic contests of war, feasting, boasting, dueling games, dueling games, gifts, and sacrifices. Sacrifice. Monarchy itself is likely to have started that way on the fringe of urban bureaucratic systems. But to continue with Scott, barbarian monarchies remain either small scale or, or if they didn't if they did expand, as was spectacularly the case under figures like Alaric, Attila, Genghis or Tamerlan, the expansion was short lifted. Throughout much of history, green states and barbarians remain dark twins, locked together in an unresolvable tension since neither could break out of the ecological niches. When the states had the upper hand, slaves and mercenaries flowed in, the, in one direction. When the barbarians were dominant, tribute flowed to appease the most dangerous warlord, or alternatively, 
sub overload would manage to organize an effective coalition. Sweep in one, the cities and either lay was to them, or more typically attempt to rule them and inevitably find himself and his retinue absorbed as a new as a new governing class. As the Mongolian adage went, one can conquer a kingdom on horseback to rule it must dismount. To rule it one must dismount. Scott, though does not doesn't draw any particular conclusions. Rather, he simply remarks that while the period from about 3000 BC to AD to AD 1600, to 1600 was a fairly miserable one for the bulk of the worst farmers, it was a golden age for the barbarians who reaped all the advantages of their proximity to dynasty states and empires, luxury to loot and plunder, a while, while themselves living comparatively easy lives, and it was as really possible for at least some of the oppressed to join the ranks. For most of history, she suggests, this is what rebellion typically looked like, the fiction to join the ranks of nearby barbarians, to put the matter in our own terms, while these agrarian kingdoms managed largely to abolish their freedom to ignore orders, they had a they had a much harder time abolishing the freedom to both away. Empires were exceptional and short lived and short lived. Even and even the most powerful Roman, Han, Ming, Inca could not prevent large scale of movements of people into and out of their spheres of control. Until around a half millennium ago, a large proportion of the world's population still live either beyond the tax collectors, purview of we purview or within reach of some relatively tight for what means of escaping it. Yet today, in our twenty first century world, this is obviously no longer the case. Sometime something did go terribly wrong. At least from the point of view of the barbarians, we no longer live in that world. But merely recognizing that it existed for so long allows us to pose a further important question. How inevitable really were the type of governments we have today with the particular fusion of territorial sovereignty, intense administration, and competitive politics? Was this really the necessary culmination of human history? One problem with evolutionism, evolutionism is that it takes away it takes ways of life that develop in symbiotic relation with each other and recognizes them into separate stages of, of human history. By the late 19th century, it was becoming clear that the original sequence as developed by two god and others, hunting, pastoralism, agriculture, then finally industrial civilization didn't really work. Yet, at the same time, the publication of Darwin's theories meant that evolutionism became entrenched as the only possible scientific approach to history, or at least the only one likely to begin cadence in, on, in universities. So, so the search was on four more, more workable categories. In his 1877 Ancient Society, Lewis Henry Morgan proposed a series of steps for savagery to barbarism to civilization, which widely adopted in the new field of anthropology. Meanwhile, Marxists concentrated on forms of domination and the move out, and the move out of primitive communism towards every feudalism and capitalism to be followed by socialism, then communism. All these approaches when were basically unworkable and eventually had to had to be rolled, to be thrown away as well. Since 1950s, 1950s, a body of neo evolutionist theory has sought to define a new version of the sequence based on how effectively groups harvest energy from their environment. As we've seen, almost nobody today subscribes to this framework in its entirety. Indeed, whole volumes 
having written take, taking it to tax or pointing out the many exceptions to its logic, we are over all that and have moved on. Will be the standard reaction of most anthropologists and archaeologists when confronted with such an evolutionary seem today. But if our fields have moved on, they have done so, it seems, without putting any alternative vision in place. The result being that almost anyone who is not an archaeologist or anthropologist tends to fall back on the older seam when they set out to think or write about the world history on a large canvas. For this reason, it might be useful to summarize the older seams back seems basic sequence here. Ben societies. The simplest stage is still assumed to be made up of hunter-gatherers like the Kung of Hadza, supposedly living in small mobile groups of 20 to 40 individuals without any formal political roles and minimal division of labor. Such societies are, are thought to be egalitarian, effectively by default. Tribes Societies like the Noir, Dayaks of Kaya or Kayapo tribesmen are typically assumed to be horticulturalists, which is to say that which is to say they farm but don't create irrigation works or use heavy equipment like clocks, they are egal egalitarian, at least among those of the same age and gender, their leaders have only informal or at least no coercive power. Tribes are typically arranged into the sort of complex lineage of totemic clan totemic clan structures beloved of anthropologists. Economically, the central features are big men, such as were typically found in Melanesia, responsible for creating voluntary coalitions for contributors to sponsor rituals and feasts. Ritual or craft specialism is limited and usually part-time. Tribes are numerically larger than bands, but settlements tend to be roughly of the same size and importance. Chiefdoms, while the clans of tribal society are all ultimately equivalent, in chiefdoms the kinship system becomes the basis for a system of rank with aristocrats, commoners, and even slaves. The Siluk, Natchez, or Kalusa are typically treated as chiefdoms, so are, say, Polynesian kingdoms or the lords of ancient Gaul. Intensification of production leads to a significant surplus and classes of full-time craft and ritual specialists emerge, not to mention the civilly families themselves. There is at least one level of settlement hierarchy, the chiefs share residence and everyone else, and the main economic function of the chief is redistributive, pooling resources often forcibly and then doling them out to everyone. To everyone. Use, usually do usually during spectacular phase. States, much as already described, these tends these tend to be characterized by intensive cereal agriculture, a, a legal monopoly on the use of force, professional administration and a complex division of labor. As many twentieth century anthropologists pointed out at the time, this sim doesn't really work either. In reality, Big men seem almost entirely confined to Melanesia. Indian chiefs, such as Geronimo or Sitting Bull, were, in fact, tribal headmen whose role was nothing like big men in Papua New Guinea. Most of those labeled chiefs in their neo evolutionist model, as we've already noted, look suspiciously like what, they, what, what we normally think of as kings and men and may we live in fortified clusters where Ermin robes support court jesters have hundreds of wives and harem enochs. However, they rarely engage in the mass redistribution of resources, at least not in any systematic way. The evolutionist response to such critics was not to abandon the sim but to find turn it. But perhaps, see, perhaps, symptoms are more predatory, evolutionists are good, but they are still fundamentally different to states. What's more, they can be subdivided between simple and complex symptoms. In the former, the chief really was just a glorified big man, 
still working like everyone else with only minimal administrative assistance in the complex fiction. He was backed up, but at least two levels of administrative staff, staff, administrative staff allowing a genuine class structure. Finally, Sifdom's cycle, which is to say that the simple of our lots, the simple of our lots were constantly, often quite methodically, trying to patch together the empires by conquering or subordinating loyal ro local rivals so as to catapult themselves towards, towards the next stage of complexity characterized by three levels of administrative hierarchy or even to found states. While a few ambitious chiefs did manage to pull this off, most felt they reached their ecological or social limits, this rankled with people. The whole jerry built the whole jerry built contraption collapsed, leaving it for some other aspiring dinas to begin trying to conquer the world, or at least those parts of it those parts of it considered worth conquering. In academic cycles at an odd this juncture had devel has developed around the use of such themes. Most cultural anthropologists view this kind of evolutionary thinking as a sort of coin relic for from their disciplines past, which no one today could possibly take seriously, while most archaeologists only employ them, terms like tribe, tribe, shift, dom, or state for lack of an alternative terminology. Yet almost every, yet almost anyone else will treat such themes as the self-evident basis for all further discussion. Throughout this book, we have spent a good deal of time demonstrating how, how deceptive all this, all this is. The reason why these ways of thinking remain in place, no matter how many times people point out their incoherence is precisely because we find it so difficult to image history that isn't teleological, that is, to garnish history in a way in a way which does not imply that current arrangements were somehow inv inevitable. As we have already remarked, one of the most puzzling aspects of living in history is that it's almost impossible to predict the course of further events, yet once events have have uh, happened, it's difficult to know what it would even mean to say something else could have uh, happened. A properly historical events, perha even perhaps, perhaps two uh, two qualities. It could not have been predicted beforehand, but it only happens once. One does not get to fight the battle of Gau Gamela over again. To see what would have what would have happened if Darius had actually won, speculating what might have happened had Alexander say been been hit by a stray arrow and they and there had never been a Ptolemy Ptolemy Egypt or Seleucid Syria is at the be at best an idle game. It might rise for fun questions. How much difference can an uh, can an individual really make? in history. But nevertheless, these are questions that cannot ever be that cannot ever be definitively answered. The best we can do when confronted with with unique historical events or configurations such as the Persian or Hellenistic empires is to engage in a project of comparison. This at least can give can give us an idea of the sort of thinking of things that might happen and at the best of and at the best a sense and at best a sense of the pattern which one thing is likely to follow another the prob the problem is that is that ever since the Iberian invasion of the um, of the Americas and subsequent European colonials colonial empires we can even really do that because there's ultimately been just one political economic system and it is global. If we wish, say, to assess whether the modern nation state in this world capitalism and the spread of lunatic asylums are necessarily linked as, 
as opposed to separate phenomena that just happen to have come together in one part of the world, there's simply no basis on which to judge. All three emerged at the time when the planet was effectively a single global system and we have no other planets to compare ourselves to. One could make the argument, many do, that for most of human history, this was already the case. Eurasia and Africa already form a single interconnected system. Certainly, people, objects, and ideas that move back and forth across the Indian Ocean and the Silk Roads, or the Roads and Iron Age precursors. As a result, dramatic political and economic changes often appear to occur in a more or less coordinated fashion across the Eurasian the recent the Eurasian landmass. To take one for most example, almost a century ago, the German philosopher Karl Jaspers noted that all the major schools of, of speculative philosophy we know today seem to have emerged apparently independently in Greece, India and China at roughly the same time between the 8th and 3rd centuries BC. What's more, they emerged in precisely those cities which had recently seen in the invention and widespread adoption of coin money. Jaspers called this axial age a term since expanded by others to use to include the period that saw the birth of all today's world religions, stretching from the Persian prophet Zoroaster circa 800 BC to the coming of Islam circa AD 600. Now, the curve period of Jasper's axial age and compassing of li and compassing the lifetimes of Pythagoras, the Buddha and Confucius corresponds not only to the invention of metal coinage and new forms of speculative thought, but also the spread of cattle slavery across Eurasia, even in places where it had barely existed before. Moreover, cattle slavery, slavery could eventually fall into decline after a succession of, succession of axial age empires dissolved the Maurya, Han, Parthian, Roman, along with their prevailing systems of currency. Obviously, it would be wrong to say that Eurasia can be treated as just one place, and therefore to conclude that comparing how these processes unfolded in different parts of Eurasia is meaningless. Equally, it would be wrong to conclude that such patterns are universal features of human development. Then might just be what happened in Eurasia. Much of Africa, Oceania, or Northwestern Europe, for that matter, was so tied into the great empires of this period, notably with the convergence of terrestrial and maritime trade routes around the Indian Ocean and Mediterranean in the 5th century BC. The arguably already much earlier, that is, that it's hard to know whether they can be taken as independent points of comparison either. The only real exception were the Americas. Admittedly, even before 1492, there must, have, there must have been some occasional movement back and forth between the two hemispheres, otherwise there wouldn't have been a human population in the Americas to begin with. Uh, prior to the Iberian invasion, the Americas were in direct or regular communication with Eurasia. They were in no sense part of the same world system. This is important because it means we do have one truly independent point of comparison, probably even two, if we consider North and South Americas as separate, as separate when, it's, when it is possible to ask, does history, does history really have to take a certain direction? In the case of the Americas, we actually can pose questions as such as, was the rise of monarchy as the worst predominant form of government inevitable. Is Syria agriculture real a threat? Can one really say that once or the farming of wheat of rich of maize becomes sufficiently widespread?
it's only a matter of time before the before some enterprising overlord sizes control of the granaries and establishes a regime of real critically administered violence. And once he does, is it inevitable that others will imitate his example? Judging by the history of pre-Columbian North America, at least the answer to us, the, the answer to all the questions is a resounding no. In fact, although archaeologists of North America use the languages use the language of bands, tribes, chiefdoms, and states. What actually seems to have happened this device all such assumptions. We've already seen how in the western half of continent continent there was, if anything, a movement away from agriculture in the centuries before the European invasion, and how plants societies often seem to have moved back to back and forth over the course of any given year between bands and something that shares at least some of the features was identified with states, in other words, between what should have been opposite ends, opposite ends, the scale of social evolution, even more, starting in its own way, is what happened in the western part of the continent, from roughly, from roughly at, from roughly AD 1050 and 1350 there was in what's now the East Saint Louis, a city, a city whose real name has been forgotten, but which is known to history of Cahokia. It 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 appears to have been the capital of what James Scott would term a classic building constant, rising magnificently and seemingly from nowhere, around the time that the Song Dynasty ruled in China in China and the Abbasid Caliphate in Iraq. Cahokia's population peaked at something in the in the order of 50,000 people. Then, it uh, abruptly dissolved. Whatever Cahokia represent, re re represented in the eyes of those under its way, it seems to have ended up being overwhelmingly and resoundingly rejected by the vast majority of its people. For centuries, after it the mist the site where the city once stood when this where the city once stood and the, and hundreds of miles of rivers fairly around it lay entirely devoid of human habitation a vacant quarter like rather like the forbidden zone in pierre bullis pierre bullis planet of the apes a place of ruins and bitter memories such successful kingdoms to how Kahokia sprang up to the south but then but then likewise crumbled. By the time Europeans arrived on the eastern seaboard of North America, Mississippian civilization as it has come to be known, but was but a distant memory and the descendants of Kahokia subjects and neighbors appear to have reorganized them, themselves into policies, into, into policized tribal republics in careful, in careful ecological balance with their natural environment. What has happened? Were the rulers of Cahokia and other Mississippian cities overthrown by popular uprisings, by popular uprisings undermined by mass affection victims of ecological catastrophe or more likely some intricate mix of all three archaeology may one day sub supply more definitive answers until until such time what we can say with some if confidence is that the societies encountered by european invaders from the 16th century onwards with the product of centuries of political conflict and self-conscious debate. There were, in many cases, societies in which the ability to engage in self-conscious political debate was itself considered one of the highest human values. It is impossible to understand the devotion to individual liberty or even the skeptical rational, rationalists of figures like Kandiyarong outside this larger historical context, or at least 
that is what we propose to show in the rest of this chapter. More much to later European authors like the imagine them, them as innocent children of nature, the indigenous population of North America were in fact heirs to their own. Low intellectual and political history, one that had taken them in a very different direction to Eurasian philosophers and which arguably ended having a profound influence on conceptions of freedom and equality not just in Europe but everywhere else as well. Of course, we are taught to treat such claims as inherent unlikely, even slightly preposterous. As we've seen in the case of to God, evolutionary theory as we know it as we know it today was largely created so as to entrench such dismiss attitudes to make them seem rather obvious if the indigenous peoples of North America are being imagined as living in a separate time or as vestiges of some earlier stage of human history then they are imagined as living in an entirely separate reality ontology is the currently fashionable term and made it consciousness to fundamentally different from our own. If nothing else, it is assumed that an intellectual tradition similar to that which produced Plotinus, Sankara or Zhuangzi can only be the product of a literary tradition in which knowledge becomes cumulative. And since North America did not produce a written tradition, or at least not the sort we are used to recognizing as such, as knowledge it generated, political or otherwise, was necessarily of different kind. And in similarity, we might see to the best of positions familiar from our own or our own intellectual tradition is typically written, written of as some sort of naive projection of Western categories. Real dialogue is thus impossible. Perhaps the most straightforward way to counteract this sort, of, this sort of argument is by citing, citing a text which describes a concept the one that Huron called on the Nong, a, a secret desire of the soul manifested by dream. Huron's believe that our souls have other desires which are, as it were, in born and conceit. They believe that our soul makes these natural desires known by means of dreams which are its language. Accordingly, when these desires are accomplished, it is satisfied, but on the contrary, if it be not granted what it desires, it becomes angry and not only does not give its body to good, to the good and the happiness, but it wishes to produce for it, but often it but often it also revolts against the body, causing various diseases and even death. Aldo goes on to explain that in dreams, such secret desires are communicated in a kind of indirect, symbolic language difficult to understand, and that the one that therefore spend a great deal of time trying to decipher the meaning of one another's dreams. Or consulting specialists. All this might seem like an oddly clumsy projection of Freudian theory, but for one thing, the text is from 1649. It was written by certain Father Rago in a Jesuit relation, precisely 250 years before the appearance of the first edition of Freud's The Interpretations of Dream. It, the Interpretation of Rim, nine. 1899, and even which, like Einstein's theory of relativity, is widely seen as one of the founding events of 20th century thought. What's more, Rago, Rago Neo is not our only source. Numerous missionaries attempting to convert other European peoples at the same time reported similar theories which they consider absurd, absurd and profusely false, though probably they concluded not actually demonic and attempted to refute in order to bring their interlocutors around, in, around 
instead to the truth of holy scripture does this mean does this mean that the community in which Kandiarong grew up was composed of Freudians? Not exactly. There were significant differences between Freudian psychoanalysis and Iroquian practice. Most dramatically in the collective nature of the therapy, dream guessing was often carried out by, by groups and releasing, and, the, and releasing the desire of dreamer, either literally or symbolically, could involve mobilizing an entire community. Ragino reported that the winter months in Arwenda town were largely devoted to organizing collective feasts and dramas, literally in order to make some important men or women's dreams come, come true. The point here is that it would be, be unwise to dismiss such intellectual traditions as inferior or for that matter entirely alien to entirely alien to our own one thing that makes the when that and how they know how they know Sony and Yeshua is that their traditions are so well documented many other societies were either entirely destroyed or reduced to traumatic remnants long before any such records could be written down one can only wonder what all the intellectual traditions might thus have been forever lost. What we are going to do in the remainder of this chapter, then, is examine the history of Eastern Woodlands of North America from roughly AD 200 to 1000, 1600 in exactly this light. Our aim here is to understand the local roots of the indigenous critique of European civilization and how those roots were entangled in a story that began at Cahokia, or perhaps even considerably either. In which we ask how of North America came to have a single uniform clan system and consider the role of the Hopewell interaction sphere. Let's start with a puzzle. We've already had occasion to mention how the same basic repertoire of clan names could be found distributed more or less everywhere across Turtle Island, the indigenous name of the North American continent. There were endless local differences, but there were also consistent alliances, so that it was possible for a traveler hailing from the Bear or Wolf or Hawk clan in what's now Georgia to travel all the way to Ontario or Arizona or and find someone obliged to host them at almost any point in between. This seems all the more remarkable when one considers that literally hundreds of different languages were spoken in North America, belonging to half a dozen completely unrelated language or families. It's hardly, it hardly seems likely the clan systems were brought over fully fetched with the first human arrivals from Siberia then they must have developed in more recent times but and here's over pass and here's our puzzle considering the distances involved it's hard to imagine how that could have, have, have happened as elizabeth cooker the yen of european studies pointed out back in the 1970s this puzzle is all the more perplexing because it's not entirely clear if not american clans so, stri so strictly be considered kinship groups at all. They are more like ritual societies, each dedicated to maintaining a spiritual relation with a different totem animal, which is usually only figuratively their ancestor. True, members are recruited, recruited by matril matrilineal or patrilineal descent and fellow clan and fellow clan members consider one another brothers and sisters whom one therefore cannot marry yet nobody kept track of genealogies and there were no ancestor cults or property claims based on descent all clan members were effectively equal there wasn't even much in the way of collective properly other than certain forms of ritual knowledge dances, dances or chants.
bundles of sacred, sacred objects and also a collection of names. A clan typically had a fixed stock of names which were assigned to children. Some of these were simply names, but like the sacred paraphernalia, they were regularly directed, direct, they were regularly directly inherited. Instead, they were, as, they, were, they were assigned to the most likely candidate where a title holder died. A community, moreover, uh, was never made up of just one clan. There were usually quite a member grouped together with two halves or moities which acted as rivals and complements to one another competing against one another in sports and burying one's, one another's death. The overall effect was to efface personal histories from public context. Since names were titles, it would be as if the head of one half of the community would always of John F. Kennedy and the other and the other always Richard Nixon. This fusing of art of titles and names is a peculiarly North American phenomenon. Some version of it appears almost everywhere on Turtle Island, but almost nowhere else in the world do we see anything quite like it. Finally, Tucker Tucker notes clans played a clans played a key role in diplomacy, not just in providing hospitality to travelers, but organizing the protocol for diplomatic missions, the paying, the paying of compensation to prison wars, or to incorporation of prisoners who could simply be assigned a name and thereby become a clan member in their new community. Even the replacement for someone who had died in that very conflict. The system appeared to be designed to maximize people's capacity to move the individually or collectively or for that matter to resolve our social arrangements. Within, the, within these parameters, there's an endless, almost kaleidoscopic range of possibilities. But where did, it, but where did this set of parameters come from in the first place? Tucker suggested it might be remnants of some long forgotten trading empire, perhaps originally established by merchants from central Mexico, but the suggestion wasn't, wasn't taken seriously by her fellow scholars. Her essay, in fact, is hardly ever excited. There is no evidence that any such trading empire, su uh, such trading empire ever existed. It seems more reasonable to assume that a ritual diplomatic system has its, origina has its origins in world ritual and diplomacy. The first point, the first point where we have unmistakable evidence that such a phenomenon could have happened, that is, where artifacts develop within virtually all parts of North America, lies in what archaeologists refer to as the Hopewell, Hopewell Interaction Sphere, a network with its epicenter in the Kyoto and Pain Creek River valleys of Ohio. Between roughly 100 BC and 8500, communities participating, communities participating in this network deposited research under burial, under burial months of a build up in the extraordinary quantities. The treasures include quartz crystal arrowheads, mica and obsidian from the Appalachians, copper and silver from the Great Lakes, corn shells and sarctids, and sarctids from Gulf of Mexico, grizzly bear, grizzly bear molars from the Rockies, meteor iron, alligator teeth, barracuda jaws and more. Most of this material seem to have been used for the manufacture of ritual deer and magnificent customs, including metal set head pipes and mirrors worn by summons, priests and a host of minor officials in a complex of organ in a complex organizational structure, the precise nature of which is fiendishly difficult to reconstruct. Even more striking, many of these tombs were located in the vicinity of gigantic artworks, some literally miles across 
the inhabitants of Central Ohio Valley has been creating has been creating such structures since the beginning of what archaeologists called the Adena period around 1000 BC. And artworks do also appear in early archaic phases of all of North American of North American history, as we've already seen in the case of Poverty Point. Whoever designed them was capable of making remarkably sophisticated astronomical calculations and, and employed a correct system of measurement of measurement. One would imagine such people could also marshal and employ and deploy enormous amounts of labor although here where we must be careful. Evidence for for more recent times suggests that the tradition of moon building could have been in some cases a side effect of creating dancing grounds or other flat open flat open spaces for face, games and assemblies each year each year before a major ritual these spaces would be swept and flattened and the accumulated dirt and debris fill up in the same place. Over centuries, this could obviously become a very large amount of material to be shaped. Among the Muscogee, for example, such artificial hills will be covered with each year by a new mantle of red, yellow, black, and up. This walk was organized by officials on rotating duties and did not require top-down structure and command. Such is clearly, such is clearly not the case. However, with really large structures of like poverty point or hop of the Hopewell at works, this this did not grow by slow accretion but were planned in advance. The most impressive sites are almost invariable in river valleys, typically quite close to bodies of water. They rise literally out of the sodden mud. As anyone who had played a as a child with sand or mud, that is pretty much, pretty much anyone, including ancient Amerindians, will be aware it. It's easy to make structures out of such material, but almost impossible to keep them from crumbling or washing ag away again in the dam location. In the in a, in dam locations, this is where. The really, the really impressive engineering comes in. A typically, a typical hot well site is a complex, mathematically aligned mix of cycles, squares, and octagons, all made by mud of mud. Of the largest, the new work, the new work it works in Licking Country, Ohio, which apparently functioned as a lunar observatory extends over two square miles and contains embankments more than 16 feet tall. The only way to keep the stable structures of this sort so stable that they still exist today was by the use of indigenous building techniques, alternating layers of earth with carefully selected graves and sand. To anyone seeing them for the first time, Rising about the swamps, the Eva would be similar to witnessing an ice cube that refused, that refused ever to melt in the midday sun, a kind of cosmogenic miracle. We've already mentioned how researchers calculating the math were started to discover that from the archaic phase of watts, geometric and ge geometry at works across large plots across large parts of the Americas appear to have been using the same system of measurement, what apparently based on the ag ag arrangement of parts into equilateral triangles. So the fact that people and materials were converging from, from far and wide upon the hot well moon complexes is not in itself extraordinary, yet as archaeologists have also observed, the geometry systems characteristic of the woodland peoples who created hot well also mark something of a break with the past custom. The introduction of a different metri metrical system and a new geometry of forms. Central Ohio was just the epicenter. Sites with artworks based on this new Hopewellian geometrical system can be found dotted along the upper and lower reaches of the Mississippi Valley. Some are the size of small towns they make and often did 
contain meeting houses, calf workshops, and charnel houses for the processing of human remains along with keeps for the dead. A few might have a few might have had resident caretakers, though, though this isn't entirely clear. What is clear is that for most of the year these sites remain largely or completely empty. Only on the specific ritual occasions did they come to life as theaters for elaborate ceremonies densely populated for a week or two at a time with people drawn from across the region and occasional visitors from very far away. This is another of the puzzles of Hopewell. It had all the elements required to create a classic green state, as Scott would define it. The Skiotopin Creek bottomlands, where the largest centers were built, as of well till they later came to be nicknamed Egypt by European settlers, and at least some of the inhabitants will have been familiar with miscultivation. But in the same way that they appear to have largely avoided this crop, except perhaps for limited ritual purposes, they also largely avoided the valley bottoms, preferring to live in isolated homesteads scattered across the landscape of mostly on high ground. Some homesteads also cons often consisted of a single family, or at most three or four. Sometimes these teeny groups move back and forth between summer and winter houses, pursuing or combining a combination of hunting, fishing, foraging, and cultivating local weedy crops in small garden plots, sunflowers, some wheat, goose food, north wheat, and may grass, along with a smattering, smattering of vegetables. Presumably, people were in regular contact with their neighbors. They seem to have got on with them well enough since there is little evidence for welfare organized violence of any sort, but they never came together to create any sort of ongoing village or, or town life. Monumental architecture on the scale of the Hopewell Earthworks is generally assumed to imply a significant cultural surplus, governed by chiefs or a stratum of religious leaders. Yet, this isn't what was going on. Rather, we find just a sort of play, of play farming, familiar from our discussions on, in Chapter 6, as well as summons and engineers who spend the overwhelming majority of their time. Of their time, with the same five or six companions, but who periodically walk out on to the stage of extended society that encompass much of the North American continent. It is also it is also strikingly different from anything we know of later woodland woodlands societies. That is that is that it's difficult that is difficult to reconstruct exactly what the settlement patterns mean in practice. If nothing else, however, this overall situation illustrates the profound irrelevance of a conventional evolutionist terminology based on a progression from bands to tribes and chiefdoms. So, what kind of societies were these? One thing we can definitely say is that they were artistically brilliant. For all their modest living arrangements, Hawaiians Hawaii produced one of the most sophisticated repertoires of imagery in in the pre-Columbian Americas, everything from FEG, FEG pipes topped by exquisite, exquisite, exquisite animals carving, animal carvings, used to smoke a variety of tobacco strong, strong enough to induce trance like states, along with other herbal constructions, to fire earthen jugs covered in, in elaborate designs and small copper sheets worn as breastplates cut into intricate geometrical designs. Much of the much of the imagery is evocative of summon ritual, vision, vision cast and soul journeys. As we noted, there is a particular emphasis on mirrors, but also periodic festivals of the dead.
but chavin the one talk in the andes or indeed poverty point social influence derive for control over esoteric forms of knowledge the main difference is that the hope world integration sphere has no discernible center no single capital and unlike the and unlike chavin it offers little evidence for the existence of permanent elites priests or otherwise analysis of Buria reveals at least a dozen different set of insignia rather ranging perhaps from funerary priests to clan chief of the final remake B. It also appears to reveal the existence of developed clan system since the ancient inhabitants of central of central Ohio developed their hero historical annual but from an archaeologist's point of view, extraordinarily convenient habit of including bits of their totem animal, jaws, teeth, claws, or talons, often fashioned with, with, with have often fashioned into pendants or jewelry in their tombs. All the clans most familiar from later North America, deer, wolf, elk, hawk, snake, and so on were already represented. The really striking thing is that, despite the existence of a system of offices and clans, this appears to be virtually no relation between the two. It is possible that clans sometimes own certain certain offices, but there is little evidence for the existence of, heredit, of a heredity rank elite. Some suggest that much of Hopewell ritual consisted of heroic styles and contests, races, games, and gambling, which, if at all like later feasts of the dead in the American Northwest, often ended by covering great treasures beneath carefully laid strata of soil and gravel so that nobody, except perhaps gods and spirits, would ever see them again. Both the games and Buria's world obviously tend to militate against the accumulation of wealth, or better put, will ensure that society will ensure that social differences remain largely theoretical. Indeed, even those systemic differences that can be detected seem to be an effect of the ritual system. For the hope, hope will Heartland appears to break down into a three-party alliance three great clusters of sites. In the northwest in the northernmost, centered on Hogwarts Hogwell itself, funerary assemblages focus on summon ritual, hairy male hairy male figures traveling between cosmic domains in the southern best exemplify, exemplified by Thurder site in the southwest Ohio. The emphasis is on an imaginary imagery of impersonal marks figures, hilltop, hilltop at shrines and tonic monsters. Still more remarkably, in the northern cluster, all those buried with, with badges of office are men, and the southern, those buried with the same badges of office are just as exclusively women. The central cluster of size is mixed in both respects. What's more, there was clearly some kind of systemic coordination between the clusters with causeways joining them. It's, informat it's informative at this point to compare and contrast the Hopewell integration sphere with a phenomenon we discussed in the previous chapter, the Ubed village societies of Mesopotamia in the 5th millennium BC. The comparison might seem a stretch but both can be conceived as cultural areas on the grandest po possible scale, the first in the respective hemispheres to encompass the entire span of a great river system, the Mississippi and the Euphrates respectively from headwaters to delta, including all the surrounding plains and coastlands. The establishment of regular cultural interaction on such a scale occur sharply contrasting landscapes and environmental, environmental niches often marks an important turning point in history. In the case of the Ubaid, it creates a certain self-conscious form of standardization, a social egalitarianism that led foundations, that led foundations for the world's first cities.
what happened in the case of Hopewell seems rather different. In fact, in many ways, Hopewell and Ubed are polar cultural opposites. The unity of the Ubed interaction sphere lay in the separation of individu the individual differences between people and households. In contrast, the unity of Hopewell lay in the celebration of difference. To take one example, while later North American societies would distinguish entire clans and nations by characteristic high styles, so it was a simple method to distinguish a Zeneca, Ondo, Onondaga, or Mohawk warrior at a distance. It's difficult to find two features in Hopewell art, and there are quite a few of them that have, a, that have the same hair. Everybody appears to have been free to make a spectacle of themselves or to obtain some dramatic role in the theater of society and this individual expressions, ex expressiveness was reflected in miniature depictions of people sporting what seemed to be an endless variety of playful, idiosyncratic styles of haircut, clothing and ornamentation. Yet, all this was intricately intricately coordinated over glass over glass areas. Even even locally each artwork was one element in a continuous ritual landscape. The artworks alignment alignments often reference particular segments of the hot world calendar, such as the saltish phases of the moon and so on, with people presumably having to move back and forth regularly between the monuments to compare a full ceremonial cycle. This is complex. One can all imagine the kind of detailed knowledge of stars, rivers, and seasons that would have been required to coordinate people from hundreds of miles, miles away such that they might congregate, congregate on time for it was in centers that lasted only four periods of six or five or six days at a time over the course of a year, let alone what it would take to actually transform such a system across the length and breadth of, of a continent. In later times, face of the face of the dead were also occasions for the resurrection of names as a title as a as the titles of those who were non now gone past to the living. It may have been it may have been two some mass mechanisms that how well disseminated the basic structure of its clan system across North America. It's even possible that when the spectacular burgers in Hopewell came in Hopewell came to an end around AD four hundred, it was largely because Hopewell's work was done. The idiosyncratic nature of its ritual art, for instance, gave way to standard dispersions disseminated across the continent, while great tracks of to fantastic temporary capitals that cross miraculously from the mud were no longer required to establish ties between groups who now had a set idiom for personal diplomacy, a common set of rules and in for interacting with strangers, in which we tell the story of Cahokia which looks like it ought to be the first state in America. One of the many puzzles of Hopewell is how its social arrangements seem to anticipate much later institutions. There was a division between white and red clans, the first identified with summer, circular houses and peacemaking, the second with winter, square houses and warfare. Most later indigenous societies had a separation between peace of between peace ships and war ships. An entirely different administration came in to force in times of military conflict, then melted away as soon as matters were resolved. Some of this symbolism appears to originate in Hopewell. Archaeologists even identify certain figures as war ships, and yet Despite all things, there is an almost total lack of evidence for a dual warfare. One possibility, one possibility is that conflict took a different, more theatrical form, as in later times when rival nations or enemy moieties 
will often play out the hostilities to aggressive camps of lacrosse. In the, cent in the centuries, in the centuries following the decline of the Hopewell centers, roughly from AD from, from AD 400 to 800, we start to see a series of familiar developments. First, some groups begin adopting mist as, as a stable crop and growing in it and growing it in river valleys along the Mississippi flood plain. Second, actual armed conflict becomes more frequent. In at least some places, this led to populations living for longer periods around their local networks, especially in the Mississippi Valley and on adjacent bluffs. A pattern emerged of a small towns of a small towns centered on a set on earthen pyramid pyramids and plazas, some fortified, often surrounded by extensive extensive stretches of no man's, no man's land. A few came to resemble tiny, tiny gold kingdoms. Eventually, this situation had led to a veritable urban explosion with its epicenter at the site of Cahokia, which, soon, which was soon to become the great city in the Americas north of Mexico. Cahokia lies in an extensive floor plain along the Mississippi, known as the Americas Bottom. It was a mountainous and fertile environment, ideal for growing maize, but still a challenging place to build a city since much of it was warmland, foggy, and full of shallow pools. Charles Dickens, who once, who once visited this place, described it, described it as an unbroken slough of black mud and water. In Mississippian cosmology, watery places like this were connected to the court underworld, seen as the diametrical opposite of a precise, predictable celestial order, and it's no doubt significant that some of the first large-scale construction at Cahokia centered on a processional workway known as the Red Rattlesnake Causeway, designed to, design to rise from the surrounding waters and leading towards the surrounding rich top tombs, a path of souls, of way of the dead. To begin with, then Cahokia was likely a place of pilgrimage, much like some of the Hopewell sites. Its inhabitants also shared with Hopewell the same love of, of games. Around AD 600, someone living at Cahokia or close by or close by seems to have come up with the idea of chunky, later to become one of the most popular sports in North America. Chunky was a co was a complex and highly coordinated affair in which running players tried to throw balls as close as possible to roll it to a rolling wheel or ball without actually touching it. It was played at several at work sites that sprang up along the American bottom. One way of holding together the increasingly disparate groups of people who came to settle there. In social terms, it had certain things in common with Mesoamerican ball games, though the rulers were entirely different. It could be either a substitute for a continuation of where it was tied to legend. In this case, the story of Red Horn, the morning star, who, much like the Maya hero twins, confronted gods of the underworld and its crown became the focus of fren frenetic gambling. When some go when some would when some would even raise themselves or their families as stakes. In Hak in Kahokia and its hinterland, we can chart the rise of social hierarchies through the lens of Chanki as the game became increasingly monopolized by an exclusive elite. One sign of this how stone Chanki dis dis uh, disappear from ordinary burials just as beautifully just as beautifully crafted versions of them start to appear in richest graphs. Chanki was becoming a spectator spot and Kahukia the sponsor of a new regional Mississippian elite. We are not sure exactly how it happened as an act of religious revelation, perhaps, but around AD 10, 1050, 
Cahokia exploded in size, going from a fairly modest community to a city of over six square miles, including more than 100 elton months built around spacious places. Its original population of a few thousand was augmented by perhaps 10,000 more, coming from outside to settle in Cahokia and its satellite towns, totaling something in the order of 40,000 in the American bottom of as a whole. The main part of the city was designed and building according to a master plan in a single burst of activity. It was focused, was a huge pex, pex earth pyramid known today as Monk's Mount, standing before an enormous plaza. In a small plaza to the west stood a wood hinge of keepers posts, making out of the sun and wall course. Some of Kahokia's pyramids were topped with palaces or temples, others with their corner, corner houses or sweat lodges. A calculated effort was made to, to resettle foreign populations, or at least the most important influential representatives in newly designed Dutch houses, arranged in neighbors around small plazas and erected and erected pyramids. Many had their own craft specializations or ethnic identity. identity. From the summit of Monk's Mount, the city's ruling elite enjoyed powers and surveillance over these planned residential zones. At the same time, the existing, existing villages and hamlets in Cahokia's hinterland were disbanded and the rural population dispersed, scattered in homesteads of one or two families. What's so striking about this pattern is it is its suggestion of an almost complete dismantling of any self-governing communities outside the city. For those who fell within its orbit, there was nothing much left between domestic life, lived under constant surveillance from above, and the awesome spectacle of, it, of the city itself. That spectacle could be that spectacle could be terrifying, along with games and fish. In the early decades of Cahokia's expansion, there were there were mass executions and burials carried out in public. As with fledging kingdoms in other parts of the world, these large scale killings were directly associated with the funerary rights of nobility. In this case, a mortuary facility centered on the pair burials of high status males and females whose shrouded bodies were placed around a surface pillar from those from some thousands of shell beds. Around them, an earthen mound was formed, precisely oriented to a zimut degree from the southernmost rising point of the moon. Its contents included for mass graves holding the stakes bodies of barely young men to one who was over fifty who were killed specifically from the for the occasion, carefully shifting to the ethnographic and historical evidence. Scholars have reconstructed the lens of what Kahokia and later Kingdom's model on it must have looked like. While something in due of the earlier clan organizations, the old moiety system was transformed into an association between nobles and commoners. The Mississippians appear to have been matrilineal, which meant that the Maiko the Miko ruler was not was not succeeded by his children by his eldest nephew. Nobles could only marry commoners, and after several generations of such intermarriage, the descendants of kings might lose their noble status entirely. entirely. So a pool of noble stud commoners always existed from which warrior and administrators could be drawn. Genealogies were carefully preserved and there was a priesthood devoted to maintaining the temples which contained images of loyal and just dogs. Lastly, there was a system of titles for heroic achievement in war which made it possible to commoners to win their way into the nobility, a status symbol symbolic in birdman imagery which also invoked the prestige of competing at chunky tournaments. Birdman symbolism was especially a mark in the smaller kingdoms. Some fifteen all they began to appear up and down the Mississippi of its largest at the places called Etowah.
moon, bonfire, and spiro. The rulers of this town were often buried with what seemed to be precious badges and insignia manufactured at Cahokia. Sacred images in Cahokia itself focus focus not so much on the hawk and falcon symbolism that appeared everywhere else in us. Fittingly, for an increasingly prominent center of intensive grain production on the figure of the corn mother, who also appears as the old woman, the goddess holding a loom. During the 11th and 12th centuries, Mississippian sites with lakes of various kinds of Cahokia appears, appear everywhere from Virginia to Minnesota, often in an aggressive conflict with their neighbors. Trade the roads spanning the continent were activated, the materials for nutrition pouring into the American bottom, much as they once had to hope well. Very little of this expansion was directly to control from the center. We are unlikely to be talking about an actual empire so much as intricate, intricate ritual alliance back up, ultimately by force, and things began to grow increasingly violent fairly, fairly fast. With a century of the initial urban explosion at Cahokia in about AD, in about AD 1150, uh, a, a giant palisaded was a, a, a giant a giant valley seeded wall was built to it only included some parts of the city and not others. This marked the beginning of the a long of a long and even uneven process of work, destruction and depopulation. At first people seemed to have fled the metropolis for the hinterlands, then ultimately abandoned the Google bottomlands entirely. This same process can be observed in many of the smaller Mississippian towns. Most appear to have begun as cooperative enterprises before co becoming centralists around the cut of the some royal line and receiving patronage of, from Kahukia. Then, over the course of a century or two, they, they emptied out in much of the same way as the Natchez Great Village as was slaughtered to do, and possibly for much the same reasons as subjects sought free lives everywhere. And they finally being sacked, being sacked, but or simply deserted. Whatever happened in Cahokia, it appears to have left to have left extremely unpleasant memories, along with much of its Batman, its Batman mythology. The place was erased from the any later oral traditions. After AD. 1400, the entire vertical expanse of the American bottom, which at, the, which at the city's height had contained perhaps as many as 40,000 people, along with the territory from Cahokia up to the Ohio River, became what referred to in the literature as the, as the vacant of uh, or, or empty quarter, a haunted wilderness of overgrown pyramids and housing blocks, and housing blocks coming back into swim, occasionally transferred by hunters, but devoid of permanent hut, human settlement. Scholars continue to debate the relative importance of ecological and society factors in Cahokia collapse, just as they argue about whether or not it should be considered a complex system or a state. In our terms, as set out in the last chapter, what we appear to have in Cahokia is a second order regime in what two, in which two or of three elementary forms of domination, in this case, control over violence and charismatic politics, came together in a powerful, even explosive cocktail. This is the same combination we found in the classic Maya edit, for whom competitive sports and warfare were similarly fused and who extended their sovereignty by bringing large populations into their orbit to organize spectacle or by capture or other forms of compulsion we can only guess at. But both in Cahokia and the classic Maya, managerial activities seem to have focus on the administration of other worldly matters 
potably in the sophistication of the ritual calendars and precise orchestration of sacred space. This, however, had real, wo had real world effects, especially in the areas of city planning, labor mobilization, public surveillance, and careful monitoring of the mass cycle. Perhaps we are dealing here with attempts to create third order regimes of domination, albeit of a very different kind to modern nation states, in which control over violence and esoteric knowledge become caught up in the spiraling political competition of rival elites. This may also explain why, in both cases, Kahokia and Demaya, the collapse of such totalizing totalitarian even projects when it happened was itself sudden, comprehensive and total. Whatever the precise combination of factor at play by about AD 1350 or 100, 1400, the result was mass defection. Just as the metropolis of Cahokia was founded through its rulers' ability to bring the first populations together, often from across long distances, yet in the end of their descendants, descendants of those people simply walked away. The Fakan culture implies a self-conscious rejection of every of the city of Cahokia stood for. How did it happen? Among descendants of Cahokian subjects, migration is often framed as implying the restructuring of an entire social order, merging our three elementary freedoms into a single project of emancipation to move away, to disobey, and to build a new social world. world. As we we'll see, as we'll see, the Osage, a Siouan people who appear originally to have inhabited the region of Fort Ancient in the middle Ohio River Valley, before abandoning it, before abandoning it for the Great Plains, used the expression "moving to a new country" as a synonym for constitutional, constitutional change. It is important to bear in mind that in this part of North America, populations were relatively sparse. There were extensive stretches of, un of uninhabited territory, often marked by ruins and effigies, the builders long since forgotten. So it was not difficult for groups simply to relocate. What we would now call social movements often took the form of quite literal physical movements. To get a sense of the kind of ideological conflicts that must have been going on. Let's consider the history of the Etowa of the Etowa River Valley, part of a region then inhabited by chest stocks of the Cocteau in Georgia and Tennessee. Across the time of Cahokia's initial takeoff between AD 1000 and 1200, this area this area of emerging from from a period of generalist warfare Post-conflict settlement involved the creation of small towns, each with its temple pyramids and plaza, and in every case centered on a large council house, designed as a meeting place for the entire adult community. Grave goods of the time saw no indication of saw no indications of rank. Around 1200, the Itua Valley was for some reason abandoned. Then, around half a century later, people returned, it, returned to it. A burst of construction ensued, including a palace and carnal house on top of Jayamon's world of warm commoner's eyes, commoner eyes, and a royal tomb placed directly atop the ruins of the communal council house. Burials there were accompanied by magnificent birth uh, costumes and regularly apparently sent from the workshop of Kahoki itself. Smaller villages were broken up, some of their old res residents moved into Itoa, and in the countryside they were replaced by the familiar pattern of scattered homesteads. Enclosed by a perimeter ditch and substantial palisade wall, the town of Itoa was, at this point, clearly the capital of some sort kingdom in 1375 someone, whether external enemies or internal rebels, we do not know. Sack Itoa and desecrated its its holy places, 
then after brief and abortive ex attempt at recopation, Etowa was again entirely abandoned as well all the towns across the region. During this period, the priestly orders scheme seemed largely to finish across much of the southeast to be replaced by warrior Mikos. Occasionally, these petty, these petty rulers would become paramount in a given region, but they lack either the ritual authority or economic resources to quit the kind of urban life that existed before. In about 1500, the Toa Valley fell under the sway of the Kingdom of Kusa, by which time most of the regional population appears to have left of and moved on, leaving, uh, leaving, behind, uh, leaving behind little more than a museum of artworks of, of the Kusa to load, to load it over. Some of those who walked away concentrated around the new capitals. In, 15, in 1540, a member of Hernando de Soto's expedition described the Mico of Cusa and his cow territory, a place now known oddly enough as Little Egypt, in the following terms. The Keshik came out to welcome him in a caring chair borne on the shoulders of his principal men. Seated on a cushion and covered with a robe and modern skins of the form and size of a woman's soul, he wore a crown of feathers on his head, and around him were many Indians playing and singing. The land, the land was very populous and had many villages with, and had many large towns and planted fields with rich wa from one down to the other. It was it was charming and fertile land with good cultivated fields stretching along the, along the rivers. In the 16th and 17th centuries, petty kingdoms of this sort appears to, appear to have been the dominant political form in much of the southeast. The rulers were treated with reverence and received tribute, but the rule was brutal and unstable. The Kusa Mikos Ritter, like, the, like that of his chief rival, the Lady of Kofi Taki, was carried by subordinate lords largely because the latter could not be trusted nor to rest up unless kept, unless, unless kept under constant surveillance. Shortly after the Soto departed, several of them of them did, did just that, causing the kingdom of Kusa to collapse. Meanwhile, others outside of the central towns, much more egalitarian forms of communal life were taking form on how the collapse of the Mississippian world and rejection of its legacy opened the way to new, form of the new forms of indigenous politics around the time of the European invasion. By the early 18th century, these petty kingdoms and the very practice of building mounds and pyramids had almost entirely vanished from the American South and Midwest. At the edge of the prairies, for example, People living in scattered homesteads began migrating seasonally, se seasonally, leaving the very young and old behind in the work towns and taking to extend hunting and fishing in the surrounding uplands before finally relocating entirely. In other areas, the towns would be reduced to, a ce to ceremonial centers or nature style hollow courts, where the Miko, where the Miko continued to be paid magnificent tokens of respect but had almost no actual power. Then, finally, when those rulers were definitely gone, people would begin descending back into the valleys, but this time in communities organized on very different principles. Small towns of, few hundred, of a few hundred people, or at most 1,000 or 2,000, with egalitarian clan structures and communal council houses. Today, historians seem inclined to see these developments as in large part as in large part a reaction to the shock of war, slavery, conquest and disease introduced by European settlers. However, they appear to have been the logical culmination of processes that have been going on for centuries before that. By seventeen fifteen, the year of the Yamase Yamis War Yamasi War, 
the dismantling of PT kingdoms were complete, was complete across the entire region of former Mississippian influence, except for isolated, isolated holdovers like the Natchez, Edwards, and Homesteads, where both things of the past and the South East come and so it came to be divided among tribal republics of the South family York from early ethnography. A number of factors made this possible. The first was demographic. As we've noted, North American societies were, with few exceptions, marked by low marked by low births by low birth rates and low population densities which in turn facilitated mobility and made it easier for agriculturalists to shift back to a mode of subsistence more oriented to hunting, fishing, and foraging, or simply to relocate entirely. Meanwhile, women who in one of Scott's grain states would typically be viewed by the male authorities as little more than baby-making machines and when not pregnant or not trying to be engaged in industrial, in industrial tasks like spinning and waving took a, took a stronger political role. Such details, pa, such details from part of the cultural background to a political struggle, struggle over the role of hereditary leadership and privilege esoteric knowledge. These battles were still being fought into the interrelatively recent times consider the nations known in colonial period as the five civil tribes of, of the American Southeast, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Cocteau, Creek, and Seminole. All of them exemplify, exemplify this pattern, being confirmed by communal councils in which all which in which all had equal say and operating a process of consensus finding, yet at the same time all set traces of the older priests, or the older priests, castes, and princes. In some, in some cases, hereditary leadership may have persisted into the 19th century, straining against the wider preference for more democratic forms of government. Some see the egalitarian institutions themselves as an outcome of self-conscious or social movements centered on the summer green core ceremonies. In the art, in art, the, in art, the symbol was the loop square. Architecturally, the symbolic template was released in the creation not just of codes of townhouses, but also square grounds for public meetings that feature with no precedent, with no precedent, precedent in the old Mississippian towns and cities. Among the Cherokee, we find evidence of priests of priests claiming to be sent from the heavens with special knowledge or to impart. Yet, we also find stories such as that of the Ani Kutani about the existence long ago of a theocratic, theocratic society governed by a heretic case of, um, of male priests and how they so systematically abused their power, particularly in the abuse of women, that the people rose up and massacred the lot of them. Much like the arguments European speakers presented to Jesuit missionaries, or for that matter, their theories about dreams, descriptions of daily life in this post, Mississippian townships over often, often feel strikingly familiar, perhaps disturb, disturb, disturbingly so for anyone committed to the idea that the age of enlightenment was the result of a civilizing process originating exclusively in Europe. Among the Greek, for instance, the post of Miko was reduced to a facilitator of the assembly and supervisor of collective granaries. Each day, the adult men of town would gather to spend much of the, of the day going about politics in the spirit of rational debate in conversations punctuated by the smoking of tobacco and drinking of caffeinated beverages. Both tobacco and the black drink had originally been, had originally been drugs in, ingested by summons or other spiritual virtuosos, virtuosos in intense and highly concentrated doses so as to produce altered states 
of consciousness how now instead they were doled out in carefully measured portions to everyone assembled what jesuits reported in the north is in the north is seems to apply here too they believe that there is nothing so suitable as tobacco to appease the patients that is why they never attend to a council without a pipe of calumet in their mouths the smoke they say gives them intelligence and enable them to see clearly through the most intricate matters now if all these sounds if all these sounds suspiciously reminiscent of an enlightenment coffee house it isn't a total coincidence tobacco for example was adopted around this period by settlers then take and then taken back and popularized popularized in europe itself and it was in the indeed promoted in europe as a drug to be taken in small doses to focus the mind obviously there is no direct cultural translation here there is there never is but as we have seen indigenous north american ideas from the advocacy of individual liberties to skepticism of revealed religion certainly had an impact on the european enlightenment even though like pipe smoking such ideas underwent many transformations in the process no doubt it would be too much to suggest that the enlightenment itself had its first steerage in 17th century in america but it's possible perhaps to imagine some future not eurocentric history where such a suggestion would not be a treat would not be treated as a, as almost by definition outrageous and absurd how the osage came to embody the principle of self-constitution later to be celebrated in the Montesquieu's the spirit of the law clearly evolutionist categories only confuse the issue here agreeing about whether how aliens were bands tribes or chiefdoms or indeed whether kahuki was a complex chiefdom or a state tells us virtually nothing in so far as we can speak of states of and chiefdoms at all in the case of native north america the state making project seems to come first virtually out of nowhere and the symptoms observed, observed by the Soto and his successors appear to be little more than the rubber left behind by its downfall. There must be more interesting and useful questions to ask of the past. And the categories we've been within this developing in this book suggest what some of this might be. As we've seen, an important an imp- an important feature in much of the americas is the relationship between esoteric and bureaucratic knowledge on the surface the two might not have much to do with one another it is enough to see how brute force can take institutional form in sovereignty or as the institution of charisma in a competitive political field the path of the path for knowledge as a general form of domination to administrative power might seem more circuitous. Thus, the kind of esoteric knowledge we encounter Javin often found it in hallucinogenic experience really, really have anything in common with the accounting methods of the latter Inca. It seems highly unlikely until that is recalled that even in much more recent times, qualifications to enter bureaucracies are typically based on some form of knowledge that has eventually nothing to to do with actual administration it's only important because it's obscure hence in the 10th century china or 18th century germany aspiring civil servants had to pass exams on proficiency in literary classics written in archaic or even dead languages just as today they will have had to pass exams on rational choice theory or the the philosophy of Jacques Derrida. The arts of administration are really only learned later on and through and through more traditional means by practice, apprenticeship or informal mentoring. Similarly, 
those who designated the good construction projects of poverty point of hope will of hope will were clearly drawing of an esoteric knowledge of some sort astronomical mythic numerological which was continued contiguous with the practical knowledge of maths engineering and construction not to mention not to mention techniques of organizing and monitoring human labor even voluntary labor which were required to release those those designs over the long term of pre-columbian theory this particular sort of knowledge always always seems to lie at the core of systems of domination that periodically emerge. Hopewell is a perfect example since the hairy games that accompany ceremonial projects were not really the basis of for systematic domination at all. Kahokia, on the other hand, on the other hand, appears to represent a self conscious conscious effort to turn that that style of administrative esoterica into a basis for sovereignty, the gradual transformation of geometry at works designed on cosmic principles into actual fortifications being only the most obvious indication. In the end, it didn't work. Political power retreated back into heroic theater, if in a decidedly more violent form. Even more staggeringly, however, the very principle of esoteric knowledge came increasingly to be challenged. What we saw in Howell was a kind of reformation in the same sense that the European reformation of the 16th century involved a fundamental reorientation of access to the sacred, albeit one which had knock-on effects in just about every other aspect of social life for the organization of work to the nature of politics. In Europe, this battle spread out over the medium of scripture, the translation of the Bible from the school ancient languages into regional vernaculars, and its, rele and its release from the close sanctuary of the high faith into the mass dissemination via the printing press. In the poor Colombian Americas, the equivalent media revolution focused focus instead on the great, quite liberal reformation of mathematical principles underlying the creation of complex geometrical artworks which capture the sacred in the spatial form. In, in spatial form. In both cases, such reformations determine how good and golden counterparty of sacred power encapsulated in stories and myths encoded on the one hand as, a, as complex layers of scripture the old and old the old and new testaments and other holy books and on the other as, as a new work, network of landscape monuments just as complex in their own way indeed there's every reason to think that the images of stonic stonic and other beings frozen and other being frozen in ancient networks were the testaments of a sort they, they were they were nonic seems that prompted the recollection and reenactment of exploits carried carried out by founding ancestors the beginning of the days and modified in the in monumental form to be witnessed by the by the powers dwelling on high while european clergy burn incense when europe european clergy burn incense to form a sentiment and sentient pond with the invisible at the start echo of biblical animal sacrifice. How well peoples lead how well peoples lead tobacco in the AVG pipes and sending smoke up towards in the heaven towards the heavens. Here we begin to comprehend what it might have meant actually to stop creating such monuments entirely or to repurpose drugs like tobacco towards collective rational debate. Of course this does not necessarily imply a systematic and enlightenment style rejection of esoteric knowledge it could also mean that it could also mean the democratization of such knowledge or at least the transformation of what had once been a theocratic elite into a kind of oligarchy we find an excellent example of this in the history of the osage a nation of great plains, the Osage are directly descended from Missy, Sipianese, Port, Asian people, and much of the ritual of mythology 
can be traced back directly to their Midwestern origin origins. The Osage, the, the Osage were doubly fortunate first because they succeeded in taking advantage of a strategic posi pos position on the Missouri River to ally with the French government and thereby maintain their independence, even creating something of a trading empire from 1628 until 1803. Second, because they are no gravel, who recommended the ancient the ancient traditions in the first decades of the tenth of the twentieth century, Francis Lafleche was himself a native speaker of Omaha, a closely related language, and therefore appears to have been unusually capable and receptive. As a result, we have a much better sense of how of how Osage elders thought about their own traditions than is the case for most other plain societies. Let us begin with a map of a typical Osage summer village. Osage communities typically move between the three seasonal locations. Permanent village of multifamily lodge houses made up of perhaps 2,000 people. Summer camps and camps for the annual midwinter bison hunts. The basic village, the basic village pattern was a cycle divided into two exogamous moities, sky and earth, with the 20th century, with the 20, 24 clan it clans it all, each of which had to re, had to represent the settlement or camp, just as at least one representative of each had to be presented had to be present for any major ritual. The system was initially based on a three-party division, seven clans, each designated sky people, earth people, and water people, with the heart of two group together as the earth moiety in relation to the sky, making 21. Then over time, this was expanded when the when clans were ready to become seven plus two sky sisu, against seven plus seven plus one earth honga. Give 24 in the total. At this point, you may well be wondering how precisely did it ever come about that people arrange themselves in such intricate patterns? How exactly decided that each of the 20, 24 clans would represent it in every village? And how did they orchestrate things so it would happen in, this, in the case of the Osses? We actually have something of an answer, since Osage's history was remembered essentially as a series of constitutional crises in which the elders of the community gradually worked out exactly this arrangement. The history, according to La, to La Fleche, is difficult to piece together because it is distributed among the clans, or to be more effect or bare bones version of the story, full of creepy allusions, is known to everyone, but each clan also had its own history, history and stock of sacred knowledge, whereby the true meaning of certain aspects of the story is revealed over the course of seven levels of initiation. The real story then can be said to be broken into 168 pieces, arguably 336, since each revelation contained two parts a political history and accompanying philosophical reflection on what on what that history reveals about the forces re responsible for dynamic aspects of the visible world that cause the stars to move, plan to go, and so forth. Records Lovelace observed had also been kept of practical discussions in which various results of this study of NATO were debated and discussed. Osses concluded that this force was ultimately knowledge knownable, ultimately un unknownable, and gave it the name Wakonda, which could alternately which could alternately translate as God of Mystery. Two lengthy investigation, La Flesh notes, elders no elders determined that life and motion was produced by the interaction of two principles, sky and earth, and therefore they, divi they divided their own society in the same way, arranging it so that men from one division could only that take wives 
from the other. A village was a model of the universe and such, and a such a form of supplication to its animating power. Initiation to the levels of understanding required a substantial investment of time and wealth, and most of such only attained the first and or second tier. Those who reached the top who reached the top were known collectively as the Nohozinga or Little Old Men to some work women and were also to the ultimate political authorities where, where everyone was, was expected to spend an hour at the sunrise in prayerful reflection, the little old men carried out daily deliberations on questions of, of natural philosophy and their specific relevance to political issues of the day. They also kept a story of uh, most important discussions. Lafleche explains that Periodically, particularly perplexing questions will come up either about the nature of the visible universe or about the application of these understandings to human effects. At this point, it was customary for two elders to retreat to a secret spot in the wilderness and carry, up, and carry out the vigil for four to seven days to, to search their minds before returning with a report on their conclusions. The Nohozinga were the body that made daily the discuss a phase of state. Why large assemblies could be called to ratify these decisions, they were the effective government. In this sense, one could say that the OSS were a theocracy, though it would be more accurate, perhaps, to say there was, a no, there was no difference between officials, priests, and philosophers. All were title-bearing officials, including the soldiers assigned to help ships enforce their decisions. We, while protectors of the land assigned to hunt down and kill outsiders who poach game, who poach game were also religious figures. As for the history, it begins in mythic terms as an allegorical fable, then rapidly turns into a story about institutional reform. In the beginning, the three main divisions, sky people, earth people, and water people, descended into the world and set out in the search of indigenous inhabitants. They, when they located these inhabitants, they were discovered to be in repulsive state. Leaving, the, um, leaving a midfield, bones and recarion, feeding, and, feeding on oval, rotting fresh, rotting fresh, each is even each other. Despite this more than Hobbesian situation, the isolated earth people, as they came to be known, were also powerful sorcerers, capable of using the four winds to destroy life everywhere. Only the chief of the water division had the courage to enter the village, negotiate with their leader, and convince these people to abandon their murderous and unsanitary ways. In the end, he persuaded the isolated earth people to join them in a federation to move a new country free from the pollution of decaying corpses. This is how the secular village plan was first and was first conceived with a wanton wizard's place opposite water at the eastern door where they were where they were in charge of the house of mystery used for all physical ritual rituals and where all children were brought to be named. The beer, the beer clan of the Earth Division was put in charge of an opposite house of mystery responsible for rituals, and for, for, for rituals concerning war. The problem was that the isolated Earth people, while no longer murderous, did not prove particularly, particularly effective allies either. Before long, everything had, ascend, had descended into continuous drive and fading. Into the water division demanded another more move to a new country, which initiated, among other things, an elaborate process of constitutional reform, make, making declarations of war impossible without the acquiescence of every clan. This to prove problematic over time, since it meant that if an external enemy entered the country, at least a week was required to organize a military response.
eventually. It becomes necessary yet again to move to another country, which this time involves the creation of a new decentralized clan by clan system of military authority. This in turn, this in turn led to a new crisis and run of reforms. In this case, the separation of civil and military affairs with the creation of a heritage of for peace of for each division, the horses placed and on the ice of the east and west streams of the village and various of the subordinate officials, as well as a parallel structure with responsibility for all five major or six villages. We will not linger over the details. But two elements of the story deserve emphasis. The first is that the narrative sets off from the translation of arbitrary power, the taming of the isolated Earth people's leader, the chief sorcerer, who abuses his deadly knowledge by according him some central position in the new system alliance alliances. This is a carbon history among the descendants of a group of groups that had informally come under the influence of Mississippian civilization. In the post of obtaining the leader, the destructive way to knowledge once had by the isolated Earth people was eventually distributed to everyone, along with elaborate checks and balances concerning its use. The second is that even though such who ascribed the key was key was to a second knowledge in their political effects in no sense so their social structure as something given from on high but rather as a series of legal and intellectual discoveries even withdraw. This last point this last point is critical because as outlined earlier we are used to imagining that the, that the very notion of people self consciously creating their own institutional arrangements is largely a product of the Enlightenment. Obviously, the idea that nations could be effectively created by great lawmakers such as Solon of Athens, Lycurgus in Sparta, or Zoroaster in Persia, and that their national character was in some sense a product of that institutional structure was a familiar one in antiquity. But we are generally taught to think of the French political philosopher Charles Louis II, Charles, Charles Louis II that Baron de Montesquieu uh, after the first to build an explicit and systematic body of theory based on the principle of institutional reform with this book, The Spirit of the Laws, 1748. By doing so, it's widely believed he effectively created modern politics. The founding fathers of the United States, all avid readers of Montesquieu, were consciously trying to put these theories into practice when they attempted to create a constitution, constitution that would preserve the spirit of individual liberty and spoke, and spoke of the results as a government of laws and not of men. As it turns out, precisely this sort of thinking was, was commonplace in North America well before European settlers appeared on the scene. It might not be a coincidence, in fact, that in 1725, a French explorer named Bergman, Bergman brought an Osses and Missouri delegation across the, across the Atlantic to Paris, across the Atlantic to Paris, around the time La Hontan's works were at the height of their popularity. It was a, it was a, it was traditional at the time to organize a series of public events around such civic diplomats and arrange private meetings with prominent, prominent European intellectuals. We don't know whom specifically they met with, but Montesquieu was indeed in Paris at the time and already working on such subjects. As one historian of the OSS notes, it is hard to imagine Montesquieu would not have attended. At any rate, the chapter in the spirit of the laws which speculate on the modes of savage government seem an almost exact reproduction of what Montesquieu more would likely have heard from them, albeit framed by an artificial distinction within those within those who do or don't cultivate the land.
the connection way may well run deeper than we think. At which we return to Irokia and consider the political philosophies likely to have been familiar to Kandiarok in his youth. We have come full cycle. The case of North America not throws conventional evolutionary seems into chaos. It also clearly demonstrates that it's simply not true to say that if one falls into the trap of stress formation, there's no getting out. Whatever happened in Kahokia, the backlash against it was so severe that it set forth the repercussions we are still feeling today. We are still feeling today. What we are suggesting is that in the indigenous doctrines of individual liberty, much mutual aid and political equality, which made such an impressive impressions, impression on French Enlightenment thinkers, when neither as many of them suppose the way all humans can be expected to behave in a state of nature. Nowhere, nowhere they, as many anthropologists now assume, seem be the way the cultural choke cookie happened to crumble in that particular, particular part of the world. This is not to say there is no truth whatsoever in either of these positions. As we have said before, there are certain freedoms to both to disobey, to rearrange social ties that tend to be taken for granted by anyone who has not been specifically trained into obedience as anyone reading this book, for instance, is like to have been. Still, the societies that European settlers encountered and the ideal expressed by thinkers like, like Kandiarong only really make sense as the product of a specific political history, a history in which questions of heredity power, revealed reli religion, personal freedom, and the independence of women were still very much matters of self con of self conscious debate and in which this, this the overall direction for the last three centuries at least had been explicitly anti authoritarian. East Saint Louis is, of course, a long way from Montreal and no one to our knowledge has ever suggested that European speaking peoples of the of the Great Lakes region were ever themselves directly under Mississippian rule. So it would be going a bit too far to suggest that the views recorded by men like La Hontan were, in any literal sense, the ideology that over to Mississippi, Mississippian civilization. Still, a careful review of oral traditions, historical accounts, and the, eff and the ethnographic record shows that those who frame was we, what we call the indigenous critique of European civilization were not only keenly aware of alternatively political possibilities, but for the most part saw their own social orders as self-conscious creations, designed as a barrier against all the Kahokia might have represented, or indeed all those qualities they were later to find so ob objectionable in the friends. Let us start with the available oral traditions. These are unfortunately somewhat limited. During the late 16th and early 17th centuries, Irokia was divided between a number of shifting political coalitions and confederacies of which the most prominent were the Wendat Huron, based in what now Quebec, the First Nations of Haudenosaunee, often referred to as to as Lake Iroquois, distributed across what's now upstate, upstate New York and an Ontario based confederation that the French referred to as the Dentrals. The one that referred to this last as an Atiwandarong, which literally means those whose speech those whose speech is not quite right. We don't, actual, we don't actually know what these neutrals called themselves. Clearly it wasn't that, but according to early accords, they were by far the most numerous and powerful, at least until the, so the society was devastated by famine and disease in the 1630s and 1640s. Afterwards, the Soviet works were absorbed by the Seneca, uh, 
given names and thus incorporated in one or the other or other Seneca clan. A similar fate befell that when that confederation, whose power had been decisively broken in the year Kandiarong was born, 1649, where they were scattered of a shop during the notorious Beaver Wars. In, the, in Kandiarong's own lifetime, the remaining Wendat were leading a fairly precarious existence, partly driven north towards Quebec, partly under the protection of her friends, fought in a place called Mihidimakinak, near, near Lake Michigan. Kandiarong himself spent much of his life trying to put the Confederation's peace back together and according to oral histories, at least attempting to form a coalition that would in a unit they will unite the warring nations against the invaders. In this, he failed. As a result, we don't actually know the stories told by members of any of these other great confederacies about the origins of their political institu institutions. By the time. Oral histories began to written down in the 19th centuries, only the how they know how they remain. We do, however, have numerous versions of the foundation of the League of Five Nations, the Seneca, Wenida, Onondaga, Kayu, Cayuga, and Mohawk, and epic known, an epic known as the Guyana Sagoa. What is most remarkable about this epic? is the present context at least, is the degree to which it presents political institutions as self-conscious human creations. Certainly, the story, con the story contains magical elements. In any certain case, the main characters, the Ganawide, the peacemaker, Jigonsaze, the mother of nations and so forth, are reincarnations of characters from the creation myth. But what comes throughout, but what but what comes to most strongly in the text is its representation of a social problem with a social resolution, a breakdown of relationships in which the country sprang in chaos and revenge, spiraling to a point where social order has dissolved away and where the powerful have become literal cannibals. More powerful of all is Adodardo, Adoha, Adodarho. Tado ha, Tado Daho, who is represented as a witch, deformed, monstrous, and capable of commanding others to do his bidding. The narrative centers of, an, of a hero, the Ganawide, the peacemaker, who appears from what is later to be anti Wandarong, natural territory, to the northwest, determined to put an end to this chaotic state of affairs. He went to his cause first, the Jigon Sase. A woman for most for standing outside of corals of outside all corals, he find he finds her hosting and feeding war practice from all sides of the conflict. And then he wa Hiawata, one of Ado Adodarho's cannibals, cannibal henchmen. Together they set about winning over the people of each nation to agree on creation on creating a formal structure for heading of the disputes and creating peace. Hence, the system of titles, nested councils, consensus finding, condolence, condolence rituals, and the prominent role of female elders in formulating for policy. In the story, the fair last to be won over is Adodago himself, who is gradually healed of his deformities and turned into a human being in the end of the loss of the leaks are spoken into bed of wampum, which serves as its constitution. The records are transferred to the keeping of Adoharho and his work finished. The peacemaker finishes from the earth. Since how the Nosoni names are passed on, uh, on like titles, th there has continued to be an Ado Adodarho, just as there is also still a Jigon Sase and Hiawata. To this day, 49 Sakims delegated to confer the decision of their nation's councils continue to meet regularly. These meetings always begin with a rite of condolence.
in which they wipe away the grief and rage caused by the memory of anyone who died in the interim to clear their minds to go about the business of establishing peace. The fifties, the peacemaker himself, is always represented by an anti priest. This federal system was the, peak, was the peak of a complex apparatus of sub subordinate councils, male and female, all with carefully designated powers, but none with actual powers of compulsion. In its essence, the story is not so different from the founding of the Osses social order, a terrifying which is brought back to into society, and the and in the process and in the process transformed into a peacemaker. The main difference is that, in this case, although Darko is quite explicitly a ruler, one invested with power and of command. South of the Odondaga, south of Odondaga town, lived an evil-minded man. His lodge was in a swell and his nest was made of bulrushes. His body was distorted by seven cooks and his long Tangled locks were adorned by withering living serpents. Moreover, this monster was a devourer of raw meat, even of human flesh. He was also a master of wizardry, and by his magic, he destroyed men, but he could not be destroyed. Adodarho was the name of the evil man. Notwithstanding the evil character of, of Adodarho, the people of Odondaga, Onondaga, the people of many hills, Obed, Obed, Obed his commands, and though it caused many loves, many lives, they satisfied his insane whims, so much, the, so much did they fear him and his sorcery. It is an anthropological commonplace that if you want to get a sense of society's ultimate values, it is best to look, to look at what they consider to be the worst sort of behavior and that the best way to get a sense of what they consider to be worst possible behavior is by examining the idea is by examining the examining ideas about witches. For the how they know Solni, the giving of orders is represented as being almost as serious and outrageous as the eating of human flesh. Representing Ado Darho as a king might seem surprising, since there seems no reason to think that, before the arrival of Europeans, either the five nations of any of their intermediate of their immediate neighbors had any immediate experience of arbitrary command. This raises precisely the question often directed against arguments the indigenous institutions of ships were in fact designed to prevent any danger of state emerging. How could so many societies be organizing the entire political system around heading of something, i.e. the state, that they had never experienced? The straightforward response is that most of the narratives were gathered in the 19th century, 19th century, by which time an indigenous American was likely to have had long and bitter experience of the United States government. Men in uniforms carrying legal briefs, issuing arbitrary commands, and much more besides. So perhaps this element was added to this narrative letters. Narrative letter. Anything is possible, of course, but this strikes us as unlikely. Even in more recent times, the danger of being accused of witchcraft was deployed against office holders to ensure that None could accumulate any appreciable advantage over the fellows, particularly in wealth. Here, we have to return the Ecochian theory about dreams as represent desi repressed desires. Mentioned earlier in the chapter, one interesting twist of this theory is that it was considered the responsibility of others to release a fellow community member's dream, even if one dream of appropriating a neighbor's position, it could be it could only be refused at the risk of endangering their heart. To do so was considered beyond a what almost socially impossible, even if one did it will cause outrage gossip and very possibly bloody revenge if somebody was told but was told to have died because 
somebody else refused to grant a sole wish, his or her relatives might retail, retail, retaliate physically or by supernatural means. Any member of an Iroquian society given an order would have wisely resisted, resisted, is, resisted it as a treat to their personal autonomy, but the one exception to this norm was precisely dreams. One who run, one who run when that ship gave away his prized European cat, which he had carried by cattle all the way from Quebec to a woman who dreamed she could only be curbed by owning it, Iroquians also feared becoming the victims of it craft practice consciously or unconsciously by people who invite them. Dreams were treated were treated as if they were commands, delivered either by one's own soul a rest and possibility, in the case of particularly vivid or potentous dream, by some greater spirit, the spirit might be the creator of some other spirit, perhaps entirely unknown. Dreamers could on dreamers could become prophets, if only this were for a relatively brief period of time. During that time, however, the orders had to be obeyed. Needless to say, they were few more terrible crimes than to falsify a dream. In other words, the image of the witch ha was a uh, was at the center of complex ideas that had that had everything to do with unconscious desire, including the unconscious desire to dominate and the need both to release it and to keep it under control. How did all this come about historically? The exact time and circumstance of the League of Five Nations creation is unclear. Deaths have been proposed ranging from AD 1142 to sometime around 1640, 1650. No doubt the creation of such confederacies was an ongoing process and sadly, and sadly, like almost all historical epics, the Guyana Sawa, the Guyana Sawa, Sawa, Guyana Sagawa patches together elements, many, historical, many historically accurate, others less so, drawn from different periods of time. What we know from the archaeological record is that, what we know from the archaeological record is that Iroquian society, as it existed, as the 17th century began to take form around the same time as the heyday of Kahukia. By around AD 1100 Mies was being cultivated in Ontario in what later became Atiwandarong, Neutral Territory. Over the next several centuries, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, became even more important in local diets. Two Iroquians were careful to balance the new crops with all the with all the traditions of hunting, fishing, and foraging. The key period seems to be what what's called the late Owasco phase, from AD 12, 30, and 13, 75, when people began to move away from their previous settlements and from their earlier patterns of seasonal mobility along waterways. Settling in palisaded towns, towns occupied all year, the route in which longhouses, presumably based in matrilineal clans, became the predominant form of dwelling. Many of these towns were quite substantial, containing as many as 2,000 inhabitants, that is, something approaching a quarter of the population of central Cahokia. References to, to cannibalism. In the Guyana Hagoa, Hagoa epic, out of pure fantasy, enemy warfare and the torture and the ceremonial sacrifice of war prisoners are sporadically documented from AD 1050. Some contemporary Hastenosoni scholars think the myth refers to an actual conflict between political ideologies within Iroquian societies at the time, turning especially on the importance of women and agriculture against defenders of an older male-dominated
or the well prestige was entirely based in what in work and hunting. If so, it would not look so very different from kind of ideological divergence we've suggested might have been taking place in the Middle East during the early phases of the Neolithic. Some kind of compromise between these two positions appear to have been reached around the 11th century AD, one result of which was a stabilizing of population at the modest level. Population numbers increased fairly quickly for two or three centuries after the widespread adoption of maize, squares and beans, but by 15th century they had leveled off. The Jesuits, the Jesuits later reported how Iroquian women were careful to space their beds, setting optimal population to the fish and game capacities of the region, not its potential agricultural productivity. In this way, the cultural emphasis on male hunting actually reinforced the power and autonomy of Iroquian women who maintained their own councils and officials and whose power in local affairs at least was clearly greater than that of their men. In the period spanning of the 12th to 14th centuries, neither the Wendat Confederacy nor how the Nosoni show much evidence of having extensive contact or even much trade with the Mississippians, whose main presence in the northwest, in the northeast, was in the Fort Ancien region along the Ohio River and the nearby Mono Monogahela Fieli. It this is not true, however, of the Atiwandarong. By AD 1300, much of, much of the entire area was indeed under Mississippian influence. It is doubtful, but not totally inconceivable, that there were migrations from the Cahokian heartland. Even if there were, the Antiwandarong appeared to have been monopolizing trade to the south and to it to the Chesapeake by and beyond, be and beyond leaving, and, leaving the Wendat and Haldensoni to form relations with Algonquian peoples to the north and east. The 16th century saw a sharp increase in Mississippian influences in Ontario, including various cults, including various cult objects and ceremonial regalia, and even large numbers of chunky stones at the same time that also appear at, at Fort Asian. Archaeologists refer to all this as Mississippianization, and it is accompanied by strong evidence for a renewed burst of trade at least, at least as far as the world culminating in, among other things, the arrival of enormous quantities of shells and shell bits derived from the mid-Atlantic seaboard from around 1610 onwards to be peeled up in the Antiwandarong tombs. By that time, the Atiwandarong, the Atiwan, Atiwandarong population was several, was several times larger than any of the neighboring confederations when that Haudenosaunee, let alone the Erie, Petun, Wengo, or other small rivals, and its capital, Ono Tisaston, was then among the largest settlements in the Northwest. Scholars, predictably, argue about whether the neutral could thus qualify as a simple chiefdom rather than a mere tribe. Certainly, the Jesuits who visited the region before Atiwandarong society was, effectively, destroyed by plagues and famines, were anonymous in, in insisting that its constitution was fundamentally different from that of its neighbors. We will probably never have the means to reconstruct the precisely in how, for instance, the French referred to the Atiwandarong as a neutral nation, largely because they took no part in the near constant conflicts within their various nations, making up the Wendat and Haudenosaunee, but instead allowed war practice from both sides of repressions to their territories. This echoes the behavior attributed to the, G to the Gigon Sase, mother of nations. The highest ranking mo the highest ranking woman of official among the latter had the Sony in the national epic, who was indeed said to have been to have been of Antiwadarong origin. But at the same time, 
The other one, Dagong, were in no sense neutral in their relations with many of the western and southern neighbors. neighbors. Indeed, according to the recollect Father Joseph de la Roche de Lon in 1627, were in the, the Atiwan Darong were dominated by our warlord Dame Suri Hassan, the chief of the greatest credit and authority that have ever been in all, in all these nations, because he is not only chief of his town but of all those of his nation. It is an example in other nations to have a chief so absolute. He acquired this honor and power by his courage and by having been many times at war against 17 nations who were their enemies. When he was away at war, in fact, the Federal Council in all other European societies, the ultimate authority, could make no important decisions. Su Harrison, Su Harrison seems to have been something at least very like a king. What was the relation of Suri Hassan and Jigon Sase, a figure who came to exemplify, exemplify principles of reconciliation that are in many ways precisely the opposite of kingship and self aggrandizement We don't know. The only source we have for details of Suri Hassan's life is very much contested an oral history purporting to be the testimony of Suri Hassan's third wife, passed down three centuries to the present day. Almost all, almost all historians discount it, but that it isn't necessarily an absolute disqualification. At any rate, according to the icon, Suri Hassan was a child prodigy, a brilliant student of esoteric knowledge. The story of his existence reached the story of his existence reached a certain Cherokee priest who traveled to become his tutor. He behold a great crystal which he said marked mark him as a reincarnation of the sun and fought many wars and married four times. But he decided to hand on his mantle to the daughter of his youngest Tuscarora wife, a similar child prodigy, disaster struck. So, infuriated by this plan, was his senior Atiwandarong life, Ati, Ati life of the highest ranking total clan, that she ambushed and killed the daughter whose mother took her own life in despair. Suri Harrison, in a rage, massacred the culprits, the culprits entire lineage, including his own house, thus effectively destroying any possibility possibility of dynastic succession. As we say, we have no idea much credit to give the story, but we do know that its broad code lines reflect realities. Atiwadarong at the time did indeed have regular connections with nations as far as far away as the Cherokee. While the problems of how the square exhorted knowledge with democratic institutions or even the difficulties faced by powerful men trying to establish dynasties when the descent was, uh, was organized according to matrilineal clans with no internal ranking would have been familiar issues in North America at the time. Suri Hassan definitely existed and he did apparently try to translate his success as a warrior into centralized power. We also know it ultimately came to nothing. We just know, we just don't know if it really came to nothing in this particular way. By the time Baron de la Hontan was serving the French army in Canada and Candierong was holding forth on questions of political theory at his period dinners with Governor Fontenac, at the anti wanderer no longer assisted since the events surrounding Su Harrison's life were likely to have been familiar to Kandiarong, as they would have been vivid childhood memories for many of elders known to him in his formative years. The Jigon Sase, mother of nations, or, for instance, was still very much alive, the last Atiwandarong holder of the title having been incorporated in the Wolf Clan of the Seneca in 1650. She remained established in her traditional seat, a fortress, a fortress called Kienuka, overlooking the Niagara Gorge. Either 
the Digon Sase o Moglatli her successor was still in 1687 when Louis the XIV decided to put an end to the ongoing threat of the Five Nations post to French settlement by sending a seasoned military commander, the Marquis de, la, de, de, Marquis de, Do, de, de Nonville, as governor with orders to use whatever force necessary to drive nations from what is, from what is now upstate New York. We have a report on what happened from La Hontan's own memoir. memoirs. Fearing interest in the peace settlement, they non feel invited the League Council as, as, as a body to negotiate terms in a place called Fort Fontenac. After the former governor saw 200 delegates arrive, including all the permanent officers of the Confederation and many from the Women's Councils as well. Summarily arresting them. Then on field ship them ship them off to France to serve as gallery gallery slaves. Then, taking advantage of the resulting confusion, he ordered his men to invade the Five Nations territory. La Hontan, who strongly disapproved of the proceedings, got himself into trouble from trying to intervene and stop some underlings from casually torturing the prisoners. He was ordered away, but in the end, spared, but in the end, spared further sanction after protesting that he had been drunk. Some, year, some years later, in a in a different context, an order, an, an, an order was put was put out for his arrest on grounds of insubordination. He had to flee to Amsterdam, and he had to flee to Amsterdam. The Gigon Sasse, however, had chosen not to attend the non fields meeting. The arrest of the entire Grand Council left her the highest ranking league, league official. Since, in such an emergency, there was no time to arrest new, chief, see, new chiefs, she and the remaining clan models themselves raised an army. Many of those recruited, it is reported, were themselves Seneca women. As it turned out, the Gigon Sasse was a far superior military tactician to Denonville. After routing the invading the invading French troops were near Vito, New York, her force her forces were at the point of entering Montreal when the when the French government sued for peace, agreeing to dismantle Fort Niagara and return to surviving Galay slaves. When La Hontan later notes that like Candiagum, those who had been Galay slaves in France were highly critical of French institutions. He is referring largely to those taken prisoner on this occasion, or more specifically, the dozen or so out of the original 200 who made it back alive. In such a later context, which draw attend to the depredations of a self appointed lord such as So Harrison. What his what his example demonstrates, we suggest, is that even within indigenous city, the political question was never definitely settled. Certainly, the overall direction in the wake of Cahokia was a broad movement away from over lots of any sort of towards constitutional subjects, carefully worked out to distribute power in such a way that they would never to return. But the possibility that they might always look in the background. Other paradigms of governance existed, and ambitious men or women could, if occasion a lot, appeal to them after he after her defeat of the non fell to the Jigon Sasi appears to have demobilized her army and returned to the process of selecting officials to reconstitute 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 the Great Council. If she had chosen to act otherwise, however, precedents were available. It was precisely this combination of such conflicting ideological possibilities and, of course, the European penchant for prolonged political argument that lay behind what we have called the indigenous critique of European society. It would be impossible to understand the origins of its particular emphasis on individual liberty, for instance, outside that context.
those ideas about liberty had a profound impact on the world. It, in other words, not only did engineers not Americans manage almost entirely to sidestep the evolutionary trap that we assume much always lead, eventually, from agriculture to the rise of some all powerful state or empire. But in doing so, they developed political sensibilities that were ultimately to have a deep influence of enlightenment thinkers and throughout and through them are still with us today. In the sense, at least, the when that won the argument. It would be impossible for a, a European today or anyone, really whatever they actually thought, to take a position like that of the 17th century Jesuits and simply declare themselves opposed to the very principle of human freedom.